And coming down to the basement, I feel like she's our BFF here in the basement. Michelle <laughs> Kagan's back. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Well, I'm great, but do you do anything other than write? I feel like you write so many great books that are so helpful for so many people. Where do you find time to do anything else, Michelle? Well, I have a full CPA and tax practice. I'm a single parent of a special needs child, and I have two dogs and four cats, so... I, don't, I just don't sleep. I was going to say, I don't know how you have hair. We have much different hair. <laughs> I have COVID hair. I need a haircut. <laughs> I think that's a lot of people. A lot of times people don't believe financial professionals, because especially financial professionals, because I think that people think that we're a different breed, that we were born, you know, knowing how to manage money, knowing how to do taxes, knowing like the perfect <laughs> stuff to do. But I know you well enough to know that a lot of this book is born out of your personal circumstances. You were going through a divorce, is my understanding, and losing your job at the same time. Yeah, that was really tough. You know, it was, it was even a little bit crazier than that, because as we were going through the divorce, we sold the place where we lived. And I was suddenly looking for a place at the same time I lost my job with an infant. It was really stressful. And I couldn't figure out what to do. I had decision paralysis. I was anxious all the time. And then I said, wait, stop, you know what to do here. And I just made myself actually little worksheets and I did one thing at a time. I figured out where I could apply for, for help to help me, you know, through that rough time. And I, then I got through it until of course, you know, because it's life crisis hits, crisis hits, and you know, you rebound, you go through it, you rebound. And I've sort of developed a way to help myself and other people get through these, these inevitable setbacks that life just throws at you all the time. Before we even dive into some of those setbacks, I guess we should start with that good news and make sure that people hear what you just said. You will come out of it like this will be OK. It will. It doesn't feel like that when you're in it. And that's why it's really important to take one step at a time and focus on what's going on right now and not worry about what's going to happen three months, two years from now. Right now, you're worried about today. And that's where your focus should be. It's when you start bringing your focus further out that you can really get stuck. Yeah. I feel like it's that, what's that kid's song? The one about putting one foot in front of the other, you know, just put one foot in front of the other and focus on that. Yeah. Let's it's, it's kind of the opposite of what regular financial advice is, which is to take big picture approach. Think about the future. My whole book is about that doesn't apply here. Don't pay attention to it. What you need to do is the opposite. Let's do that. Let's go through some of these uh, some of these big issues that people have to recover from financially. Of course, a lot of these people have seen in the last uh, couple of years with COVID, of course. Yeah. But but let's start off that with a health crisis in the family. You had a health crisis in your family with your son. We're doing having it right now, actually. We, my child, uh, who goes by they them, um, has some disabling mental health issues. And we're, you know, looking at going in hospital and stuff. And I was talking to the intake people. I was like, I need a range of how much it's going to cost, you know, just a, a general idea. And they basically said to me, well, the minimum it's going to be is $3,000. I'm like, okay, $3,000. I command it. And I'm like, well, what's the maximum I'm thinking it would be like 5,000, 7,000. 45,000. So that's a pretty big range. 3,000 3, to 45,000. <laughs> I don't know how to plan and I'm like, why can't you just tell me how much? Well, we have to talk to your insurance, but I'm like, it's so frustrating with medical care. And I don't know if you know this, but mental health care is even worse than regular medical health care for coverage, for finding treatment, for getting into a program without a six week waiting period. It's really frustrating and it's really expensive and it's hard to manage because you really don't know until you get those bills, how much it's going to be. You said when Very those, annoying. yeah, when those bills came, they were widely way off what you thought they were going to be. They weren't at the 45,000, but they well, thank weren't, I, I had sort of planned on like 7,000 and, and it was a lot more than that, but yeah. you know, you do what you have to do. And then with divorce, you, you point specifically, <laughs> speaking of bills, Michelle, you, you point specifically to those legal bills. Those add up quickly. Absolutely. And it's an unfortunate circumstance, but a lot of times 
people use their lawyers as accountants and therapists, and and they sort of make them all in one professionals, which ends up bumping up their legal bills without actually giving them effective help in the other areas. So one of the things I talk about is make sure you're using your lawyer for legal issues. Period. That's it. Yeah. Right. They're not. They're not financial experts. They're not therapists. I would have to tell clients that just, you know, and on a much, much um, easier basis, I guess. I don't know if easier is the word, but working on estate plans, I would have to remind clients, lawyers work on billable hours. So come with your list of questions, get the questions in, make sure that we just keep those hours low, hire the professional, yeah. get the help, but get, but get to your point, get them where they're going to be effective and forget the rest. Yeah. That's tricky to do, especially when you're in a really emotional situation. But if you go in prepared, like you just said, with questions, with the issues that you're trying to solve. And I also found that communicating by email tends to be less expensive than communicating by phone because mm it naturally has a, a closing point and it, and it's not open-ended. Yeah. You don't feel like, uh, I remember when I moved from Michigan to the South, I adopted the third thing rule, which meant that the third thing we talked about was actually the point. Because <laughs> if I, if I, if I did what we did in Michigan and I immediately sprang to, Hey, Michelle, I got this thing. It's, it's, it's just very rude. You know, instead it's, Hey, how you doing? How's your family? What's going on? And then, and then we would jump into it. I just needed that to slow down and kind of fit in a little bit in an email. You can kind of get right to the point. Uh, your next one on your list was a death in the family. And I love your advice here, which I remember this from when I was a financial planner, do nothing here for a while is okay. Yeah. It can be really overwhelming, especially if the person who you've lost is the person who did the majority of financial finagling in your family, it's not a good time to make big decisions. Yes, you need the bills to get paid now, but you don't need to decide if you're going to sell your house right now. You don't need to decide what you're going to do in a year right now. Right? You have to give your yourself a chance to get to a better place where you actually can pay attention before you start making those big financial decisions. I know that's different for everybody, but in your experience, what, what is that amount of time? Is it a year, uh, two years? You know, it differs for what the decision is based on. So something like, should I sell the house is usually something like around a year, but something like, do I need to get a job? Do I apply for this or that? That usually starts to kick in in around three or four months when people really start realizing they need to have some kind of something. And then they're dealing with the emotional and the financial part. So it's really important to work with somebody who you feel comfortable with and you don't feel judged by or rushed by because you're not going to make good decisions if you're feeling pressured. You talk about that a lot about if you feel overwhelmed, hiring help. What type of help is out there on a financial basis for the average person? You know, there's everything from uh, financial coaches to CPAs who do taxes to uh, somebody I have found invaluable, which is medical benefits coordinators. Mm. There's so many kinds of financial advocates, financial planners, estate planners. And, you know, credentials are obviously super important here because you want to make sure you're working with a professional and not just a self, you know, like a self-realized yeah. person who has like gone through and has their own financial journey, you want to work with somebody accredited, but you also really want to make sure that you click with the person because this person is going to be, have a very big part in your life, at least for a little while. And you're going to be talking about things that for most people are really uncomfortable. Money is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. And during a crisis, there's even more anxiety involved. So you really need to feel comfortable with the person so that you can really be honest with them and not feel like you're trying to please them or you don't want to disappoint them or that they're condescending to you. You want to feel like they're on your side. You, you in fact, told me a story just before we hit record while we were catching up from the last time, <laughs> from the last time you were here about that. You were helping somebody very seriously. You were helping somebody buy chairs and just make some of these little moves. Yeah. Sometimes the scissor, I mean, a lot of times people think that I shouldn't be having financial anxiety or problems if I have money, but that's not true at all. Financial anxiety can strike anybody. And I, I was working with a client who it was a decision paralysis combined with anxiety about spending the money on the chairs, even though they had plenty of money. So 
we went online together. We on a Zoom call, we screen shared and we picked out some chairs and we talked about how they were going to be paid for. And we set a delivery date together because it, they were just so overwhelmed in general that they couldn't buy chairs. It happens. It happens to everybody sometimes. You have a whole um, spreadsheet at the beginning, and I found this very surprising. You have a whole spreadsheet at the beginning around separating emotions from facts. Tell me where that came from and how powerful is that with people to actually write down these things? You know, it came from my personal experience, honestly. And it also came with, from some of the people that I work with regularly in, in sort of coaching in a coaching capacity. Fear and anxiety makes things seem very different than they are. So knowing what the actual fact is versus what your brain is making it seem like is a really important distinction. And it's really important to also acknowledge what you're afraid of happening. You know, the person who was buying chairs, they weren't afraid to spend a thousand dollars. They were afraid, their fear was, if I spend too much, I'm going to end up homeless. And like it spirals out. And then they think, oh my God, buying chairs equals losing my house or being poor or being in debt, or it spirals out of control with anxiety and fear brain. And during a crisis, when you're already overtaxed, you're caring for yourself, you're caring for another person, you've got all these new changes going on, you don't know what's happening, it's even bigger. So it's really important to say, hey, I acknowledge that this is my fear. Don't judge it. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to stop having it. Just address it. This is what the fear is. Okay. But what is that? What is really happening in my actual financial life? So the fact in the case of the chairs, the fear is this is if I spend this money, this is the first step to homelessness and I will go broke. The fact is I need chairs to sit on and I can't live a life without chairs. Right. And based on my existing resources, I can afford to buy these particular chairs without a financial crisis, creating a financial crisis. Yeah. And I got to imagine just the just the journaling of that, Michelle, just the you know, for me, sometimes the tactile feel of writing it out, not not even typing it, just writing it longhand. Mm -hmm. Very cathartic. I find that personally very helpful as well. For me, it's very helpful to remind myself that what's flowing around in my brain is not necessarily what's happening on the ground. Is there anything different? The, the, the next big crisis you talk about is a job loss. Is there anything big to do at the beginning when it comes to job loss? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of things. So the, one of the first things you want to do is find out what your insurance, your health insurance options are. Because for a lot of people, they lose their job, they lose their health insurance and their life insurance sometimes too. So you really want to, if you're counting on that coverage and it's, and you need to know what's happening with it, you need to know what your options are with your, if you have a 401k. So for example, once you're not working at a company, if you have a 401k loan out, you have to pay it back and you can't take out more 401k loans. So finding out what your benefit options are, knowing if you have to pay any money back, knowing what your severance is or going to be and the tax implications, you know, because if you get a big severance, for example, it can pop you into a tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And for some people, for example, if they've lost their job in December, they may ask for the severance to be paid in the next year oh, yeah. when their income is going to be lower so that it doesn't bump them up into a much higher tax bracket and screw them in April. Yeah. Imagine you need every dollar of this and the tax people take take a yeah, third of it. It's or a whatever. lot. Yeah. So it's, it's something to consider, but you have to plan all that almost right away because once it's been paid out, you're out of luck. Once you say no to COBRA because it seems expensive, but you haven't checked out your other options yet. By the way, COBRA is often less expensive for better insurance than going and finding another plan, as expensive as those are. <laughs> so before you lose access to your options, you need to know what those are. Got to move quickly there. You go through, there's these, there's these rules that we have in personal finance, right? Build your, <laughs> build your cash reserve, minimize debt, work on your retirement, like all these check boxes. You say in the book, you have to throw those rules away and there's a new set of rules for you when you're in financial recovery. What's the difference between the old rules and the new rules? Okay. Well, the old rules are sort of long-term lifelong rules. 
the, the rules for right now are the right now rules. They're temporary. So you have to remember that they're, they're very uncomfortable for a lot of people, but they're temporary because when you are in a financial crisis, preserving resources is your most important option, increasing in, and preserving resources. So one of the things I tell people to do, which sounds insane coming from a financial professional is borrow money right away before your credit takes a hit. As soon as it's clear that you're using credit cards a lot more or that you don't have income coming in, it's going to be much harder to get access to loaned money. You're going to have a higher interest rate. So borrow that money right away. And if you don't need it, you can pay it back. And, you and want to maximize your resources. And maximize your lines of credit wherever you can too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is, again, the opposite. <laughs> you know, you want to increase your, your credit card available. Well, you, you want to just do all that right away. Well, and I'm also thinking too, something that sounds insane, but I would guess based on that is you would probably also tell people to make the minimum payments on their bills. Absolutely. Minimum payments, hundred percent. And also stop contributing to retirement accounts. Day one, stop, stop contributing to retirement accounts, putting money in savings you can access. That's fine. Don't lock up any money right now. And again, it's temporary. So it's not like you're going to never get back on track with retirement. But when you need cash today, you don't want it locked up in your 401k. Right. Two more things I want to ask you about. Number one is this is a time when a lot of people just want to dig a hole that you you feel a strong sense of depression. You write, you say in this wonderful paragraph, you talk about how you can't do that. You have to stay networked to people. Yeah, it's very isolating to go through a financial crisis, a job loss, a divorce, some kinds of health crises, like all of those things can come with really negative emotions. They can make you kind of internalize. You don't want to talk to people about what's going on and you isolate and that can actually make your financial troubles harder. And I'm not saying you should be asking people for money, but emotional support, just having someone to talk to, even not about this stuff. Yeah. You need some kind of, of support and other humans in your life, even if you don't tell them what's going on. I saw that so many times when I was a financial planner, Michelle, that people would just put themselves in this cocoon and it was never good. It, it That never worked out well. Which, by the way, mm -hmm. brings me to my last point, which I absolutely love. This might be my favorite part of the entire book, and there's so much stuff that I love, <laughs> but it's okay. to celebrate your wins. And you talk about it might be hard to see the wins because there's so much bad crap going on, but celebrating your wins. Talk about that for a moment. People, they forget to do that. And they think like a win is like paying off a credit card. But right now, that's not a win. Like right now, a win is actually like buying the book, right? <laughs> filling out one worksheet, raising the limit on one credit card. Any little thing you do that expands your resources and takes even a tiny bit of stress off of your situation, everything like that is a win. Buying the chairs. Yeah. Is buying a, the chairs is a win. Is a giant win. The book is the, the book is the financial recovery workbook, a step-by-step -step plan for gaining control of your money and your life during and after a personal financial crisis. Uh, Michelle, you've written so many great books and uh, another fantastic one that I know is going to help a lot of people. I'm assuming it's available everywhere. Yes. Do you, do everywhere. You, it, it, <laughs> it, it is funny when I go to the finance section, I already see there's like the Michelle Kagan area, which gets bigger and bigger. But, <laughs> but, but, but now I swear you're going to have like your own shelf at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> do they actually have any more stores I, hopefully I I hope. I, I hope so and especially the independence <laughs> yeah thanks for hanging out with us and talking about getting back on our feet I really really appreciate it thanks for inviting me over I always love being here 